Aloha, and welcome to the Creative Life Show, brought to you by Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleece, and president of the American Creativity Association's Austin chapter. We are here today to answer the question of whether kids are afraid to be creative or merely unwilling. Joining me to answer this question is a panel of leaders in four organizations that are keeping creativity alive in the world today and safe for our children. Hmm. Coming to us from the group hosting the annual World Creativity and Innovation Week is their deputy steward, Bethany Schwann. Aloha, Bethany. Aloha. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Going around the room and a little north of where I'm sitting today in Austin, Texas, from the Canadian Network for Imagination and Creativity are Michael Wilson and Peter Gamwell. Aloha, Michael. Aloha, my pleasure. And to you, Peter, aloha. Aloha, Phyllis. It really is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, you are so welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from your team. And moving around the world to really right now to a little bit of north uh, of Texas and in Oklahoma, we've got the National Creativity Network uh, represented by Susan McCalman and George Zucros. Aloha, Susan. Aloha, Phyllis. Thank you again so much for inviting me to be part of this. You're welcome. And aloha, George, and you're in Minnesota, right? Oh, no. Never say that to us. We're in Wisconsin. Aloha, <laughs> Phyllis. I was wondering if you were from the, from the Badger State. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, and so, I'm, all right. So, so, moving around the room, um, there. Well, I've checked you all in. I think I'm Phyllis Bleas calling in on behalf of the American Creativity Association. Now, to get started, I want to share with you the opening questions raised by Sir Ken Robinson in a profoundly moving TEDx, which is to this day the most watched TEDx show ever. And mm -hmm. it was produced in 2006, I think. Mm -hmm. He made the case, a very moving case, for creating an education system that nurtures rather than undermines creativity uh, in the world for our children. And it's called Our Schools Killing Creativity. Sir Ken asserts, that creativity is as important in education as literacy, and it should be treated with the same status. And he goes on to say that schools beat out of children their courage to take a chance or to make a mistake, be wrong about something, and that if you are not prepared to be wrong, you will never be creative. And by the time these children get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity, the capacity to be prepared to be wrong. And then they become frightened to be wrong. And we now have companies around the world that are just like this. We stigmatize mistakes. And we are now running a national education system in most countries of the world, maybe all, where mistakes are the worst things that you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. So Sir Ken believes passionately that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it, or rather we are educated out of it. And this panel today is going to be addressing these questions. And I ask you panel, do you agree? And why is this that we're educating creativity out of our kids? And to just double up a little bit on these questions, I had a viewer uh, just before the show who knew the show was coming on call and ask me about what has happened to the generation of kids who were just starting school in 2006 and who are now in their mid-20s. They're all in the workforce right now. So opening up the panel, would someone like to speak to this? I would 
be delighted to speak to it and state unequivocally from the very beginning that kids are neither afraid and nor are they unwilling uh, to be creative. The, the critical factor is that when you come across learning cultures, classrooms, schools, uh, families, which, which determine to set in place the right balance of conditions, then the natural creativity, the natural potential that lies in every single child and every single adult will, will flourish. Um, 2001, I did a PhD study with, with a group of grade eight uh, students. And uh, the, the whole point of the study was to, to teach them their language and literature <clears throat> uh, curriculum using the arts as a catalyst for six months. And boy, did they ever rise to that occasion. These were ordinary kids in an ordinary school, and they'd never had that type of approach before. It took me two or three weeks to focus on trust building. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a huge part of this. But once they got into it, uh, and once they understood that what I was asking them to do was to interpret interpret their learning in a way that made sense to them. That could be through art, drama, music. I didn't care. And it awakened that learning culture with those kids. Um, and Peter, I want you yes. to stop there just for a moment. I want to point out that in education, uh, about 15 years ago, we had a budget crunch in the Austin Independent School District. And they the first thing that they wanted to cut was the arts. And, it, it, and, and, you, and so this is so innovative, using the arts as the medium with, within which to reach out to what I'm hearing, uh, bringing the kids in. And imagine cutting the arts and music. The two, two, the two big things were art, music, and uh, Spanish as a second language. All three were yep. the first things cut. And it's awful. Yeah, and I, I, I think you have something to show us today about the results of that. Is that true? We have a well. It's it's the the next. What happened after that study? I, I, I a, a remarkable opportunity came up came along for me, and I was appointed superintendent of the Ottawa Carlton District School Board, which is a very large school district here in, in Ottawa. And uh, my responsibilities were leadership for the entire district, and that morphed into leadership and creativity. So I led a creativity movement, which at the time was uh, uh, was not welcomed by everybody because the focus of the ministry was uh, we need to get the marks up in mathematics and literacy. And my focus was to say, you know, what we need to start with is embrace the idea that every kid has a seed of brilliance within them. And it is our foundational responsibility to set in place the conditions, to find out what that is, to grow them from that in the context of a strength-based culture, uh, because deficit thinking tends to uh, take people down rabbit holes, and yet it is so common in organizations for a series of reasons. And and by getting those two, by embracing the concept of a seed of brilliance in everybody and embracing a strength-based approach, you foster a culture of belonging, which for me is the most important thing. So, yeah, we led this. Uh, it was a 14-year initiative, seven or eight events each year. Each of them focused on two or three things. Number one was the celebration of the brilliance in everybody and the idea that you need to flatten the hierarchy. So uh, it was when you walked into one of the events, you didn't have to wonder what it was about because there were creative initiatives, hundreds of them from schools, from the community, from the indigenous community, from the multicultural community. And it was just awake with brilliance. And mm. over a period of time, this had a deep impact on the culture and teachers started to take risks. And I think we have, uh, there was one, one teacher, uh, I just finished this briefly, one, one of the teachers, a, a lady called Rebecca Chambers, She'd been following this uh, this movement over the years, and she made a decision. She she made a decision to fundamentally transform the way she she shaped her high school high school social studies classroom. And so uh, I followed her for a total. I still follow Rebecca of six years, and I've got oh, hundreds of videos of their kids. No exams, no quizzes. She took those kids on a journey. First of all, a journey of self-understanding who they were as learners, and she taught them that there are many different pathways to learning and, and to knowing, and that the more of those they explored, the, the more they would awaken themselves. 
And then she introduced the concept of the power of community. So all of them were encouraged to go out into the community and do things. How did this impact on kids? It was incredible to see what she did and how many lives she transformed and continues to. I was into one of her celebrations of the extraordinary because she didn't do exams. She had the kids present through metaphor in a in a setting, um, uh, in, in a resource center. And you, you've got a, a glimpse into this. And the kid you're about to see, never seen me before in his life, uh, Saxon, but he had created a jail for himself. So I interviewed him from oh. jail. Oh. So, uh, Saxon, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to see you in this state. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a little bit, what's going on, Saxon? Um, I'm being restricted by school. And <laughs> How on earth does that happen? School is such an open place. Well, there's a lot of stuff that we're forced to do. There's a lot of stuff that we're we're forced to learn, and we don't really have freedoms within learning those things. Okay, can you give me an example of that? Have you felt that right the way through school section? Through most of school, I mean, like this class is a little bit different, but I would say for most of my classes, I've been told how to learn, I've been told what to learn, and I've been told what to present. That's very interesting. Yeah. So. This class is a little different to that? Yeah, it is. In, in what way, Saxon? Um, well, you see, we have inquiries, which um, basically we, pish, we pick an issue, yeah. and there's freedoms and restrictions within those, but we're given a lot more freedoms than any other class I've ever been in. So, and What's that done for your thinking? Um, I think it's it's opened up my mind a lot, and I've, I've learned to think different ways. I've learned to think way more creatively, and I've been given that opportunity to think a lot creatively, a lot more creatively than any other class I've ever been in. Well, I have to say, the metaphor that you're using of the jail and the handcuffs, it's very powerful. Thank you. I think, I mean, obviously having the autonomy, would you have ever done this in another class section? Never. What made you think of this? Um, well, I think this semester hasn't really been a great semester for me in terms of grades, but I've, I've been kind of frustrated because I, I've, I've been thinking that um, in a lot of these projects, if I was given the freedom to do what I really wanted and to show what I really wanted and how I wanted to, yeah. I think I could have done a lot better. And I think I would have learned a lot more too. Do you mean in your other subjects? Yes. Very interesting. Uh, if you if you had the power to do it, or let me rephrase it, if you could give advice to the public school system, yeah. thinking of the young people coming behind you and how you want their experiences to be, yeah. what would that advice be, Saxon? Um, I would say that I think we need to treat everybody as an individual and not have them as cookie cutter people. Everybody's different, and I think that everybody learns differently. And if we could figure out a way to have everybody learn the way that they learn best and the way that they want to learn, I think that everybody would be way smarter and we would advance as a race. You have a remarkable mind, young man. Oh, thank you. Don't ever forget it. Thank right. you so much. Hey, no problem. Oh, wow. If everybody could be allowed to learn in the way they learn best, yep. it would make the world out of, out of his, out of the words, out of his mouth. And Are we doing that? He had no that? idea I was going to ask him that question. He'd never seen me before. And I love the way he ended it. If we, if it could be personalized, I'm not using his words, but if it could be personalized, I think we'd have a better race. What a beautiful way to put it. Anyway, I've got hundreds of those videos with these kids, not just from this classroom, but from others. It's just a matter of embracing the, the idea that all of those kids and all of the adults as well have got seeds of brilliance and, and providing the autonomy to set in place the culture which cultivates that. Right. So, Bethany, you were nodding. When uh, when he first when the when the student first started talking and you were smiling and nodding and I know that you are now the uh, deputy director 
for the World Creativity and Innovation Week. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I wonder if you could share with us what he might have to look forward to being part of once he gets out of school. Does he does he step away from any possibility of being understood as a creative, imaginative, innovative young man, or mm -hmm. or or what's what's happening on this global stage, world stage? Mm -hmm. Yes, a great question. It's interesting. Um, um, Saxton brought up quite a few amazing points in his interview. Um, the, the thing that struck me the most about him was um, his mention of compliance. We are not allowed to do things in classrooms. We're not allowed to step out of bounds. Mm -hmm. And um, creativity by it, definition is thinking differently, right? Approaching problems differently, divergent thinking. And so it's interesting to see him um, really understand that from, from the courses that he was already taking and how different that course was that he was in. Um, globally, we are we are trying to strengthen and promote divergent thinking and um, just approaching everything that you do in a potentially different way, whether that is traveling to work via a new route or um, celebrating with your friends and asking different questions, remaining curious as, as you grow and as you experience life, making connections all over the place. And it's been fun to see how much growth we are actually receiving at World Creativity and Innovation Weekend Day. Um, we have grown um, quite a bit over the past two and a half years um, that we have had it. We um, we have, um, I, I believe, 160 countries now celebrating with us everything from education to government to private organizations and individual people. Um, so it is it is quite and, amazing. And just before you go too much further, yeah. we have we have two slides giving yeah. the audience sort of a gestalt of these 160 mm -hmm. countries. And when the shows yeah. you see the show, you'll be able to freeze the screen and, and take a look. This is the first set of countries. And the next slide, Michael, uh, continues the count. And I would, I would say there's something for, um, all, in 160 countries, there's pretty much something for everybody uh, to be doing what, like during this week? Yes. Day. So you talk about a week and a day, and that sounded confusing. And sure. What, what are you talking about? Absolutely. So the week is April 15th through the 21st every year, and um, it is celebrating everyday creativity. So it is um, it is celebrating with your friend, trying something new, um, attending an event or a seminar or speaker. Um, it is, and then the day is, is promoting the world and making the world better using creativity and innovation, um, to promote and, um, further the United Nations 17 sustainable development goals. So okay. not only increasing your own creativity in the everyday creativity, but um, also um, promoting the UN's um, SDGs. Okay, so now, so that's what we do every day. And I think we have another, another slide showing some of the celebrations going on in the world. Uh, is that from last year? It the, is. The week? So that's a 1,700 and... 97 total yes. celebrations equals four celebrations per person? Um, it, with the, the little people are representative of four celebrations. Okay. So that's that's how the the that chart was built. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we we've had seventeen hundred, close to eighteen hundred individual celebrations with World Creativity and Innovation Week and Day, um, and it has been a little bit of everything from education to the weeest of children, um, kindergartners and preschoolers, up through Fortune five hundred companies um, using creativity and understanding the importance of creativity and innovation in their every day work. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit for everyone and you can find great examples of celebrations and places to get connected on our website. Okay. Well, and to talk 
to one of those celebrations it, it coming up in April. I'm not sure if it overlaps. I'm sorry, I lost track of that. But Michael Wilson from Canada, from Ottawa, could you tell us what the Canadian Network for Imagination and Creativity has in store for the folks? Is it in Ottawa? Uh, the live yes, event? Yes, I, I'd be pleased to. Uh, first of all, it's um, everything that Scenic does. That's the Canadian uh, Network for Imagination Creative. We, we call it Scenic uh, yes. because Canada is a very large country with very few people. So there's a lot of scenery there. So Scenic, <laughs> you know. And it, <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, and Scenic was uh, formed, uh, oh, it's a recent, we're the new kid on the block. Uh, because uh, I noticed when I was invited to speak at a conference at the University of New Brunswick in 2017, I thought it was just another arts conference. And um, I found out that the person running the conference was uh, Dr. Mary Blatherwick, who heads up an organization called the Atlantic Center for Creativity. I organized a conference in which uh, creativity was used as a, a motivation guide for all sectors of society. She had members from everywhere at this conference, from architecture to law to um, the medical network to government officials to educators to everything. And I said to her, Mary, you have to go national with this. We have to make this national. And uh, she said, OK. And um, so we did. And um, we invited people from across the country to join us in a steering committee. And we've got people from Vancouver and the Maritimes and Ottawa, quite a few people from Ottawa. And, uh, and of course, uh, with us today is uh, my distinguished associate, Peter Ganwell, who's a member of, not only a member of Scenic, but a, a driving force behind everything they do, as you might imagine from his uh, <laughs> talk to about Saxons a little while ago. <laughs> also, uh, everything Bethany mentioned uh, is also embedded in what we're trying to do on a national basis. Mm. And um, we we have a number of unique characteristics. One of the most interesting to me is something called our monthly idea jams, which is actually a word I stole from Peter. And um, it's a monthly um, relaxed conversation in front of a fireplace about a topic relating to creativity that's introduced by a presenter. And we spend an hour on Zoom having a casual, relaxed discussion about it. And sometimes we have conversations sufficiently deep that people actually cry on the air because they felt our first opportunity to speak deeply about themselves without the fear of being judged. Mm. And aren't we talking about the fear of being judged, whether it's kids in school or adults in life? Mm. And so... Uh, that's the general frame of what we do. And of course, we've got another one of these idea jams coming up on Thursday evening, the day after tomorrow. And mm -hmm. we'd like to invite everybody here to join us mm -hmm. for that session. And it begins at seven o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, runs for an hour. And I know, Bethany, you've been to one or two of these. And so we invite all of you to join us. It's completely harmless, but okay. it allows us it allows us to have relaxed discussions about any sector of creativity that we're involved with without fear of judgment from anyone. We accept the opinions of all. And so we, as I'd like to tease people, uh, we invite everybody, their colleagues, their friends, their enemies, their relatives, and we even accept pets. So, okay. So, so we, um, and, we and can, speaking the on link, the, the link uh, yeah. to that, is that on your card when we do the, when we do the outro, will the link to that, to the idea jam be there, or do we need to leave it? in the notes with the show after it posts. Either and of those will get you to where you want to go for Thursday night. Okay. Uh, some of you are on my uh, lister for scenic. You get nasty, annoying notes from me all the time. And you'll you'll see directions about that. So uh, people you... can self-subscribe uh, to this yeah. mailing list and then get invitations. Yeah. And then it, there's there's an odyssey happening. Uh, yes. Now, I, I just want to frame that. And I'm going to let Peter speak because once he starts, he won't be able to stop. Okay. So I've just talked to you about the macro of what we do, mm -hmm. the wider implications of what we're trying to do. But we're trying a big experiment now in Ottawa, Canada, of going to the micro of what we've been talking about. It's a bit like Peter interviewing that student, his jail sentence, as it were. 
and an indication through one person of what is wrong with the public school system, at least in Canada. I have no idea about how things are in enlightened USA. Um, and uh, this is a, another example of going from the wider field to a specific example right here in Ottawa from a usage made from an old school and from an illumination of a school for social innovation at one of the smaller universities in Ottawa. And without talking about it any further, ladies and gentlemen, here he is once again, Peter Gamwell. <laughs> Peter. Oh, dear. You you only thought you were running this show, Phyllis. I'm afraid, I'm afraid <laughs> that ship has sailed. Um, <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, Michael mentioned to me about seven or eight months ago about this idea of having a live, uh, a, a live idea jam, and I think I referenced earlier that we had done seven or eight of these events every year for that sixteen years of the creativity movement with the school district. So it immediately got my juices flowing, and I immediately, I think we immediately knew what we wanted to do, and it's grounded in this: the world is in a state. It's a mess. And there are all sorts of people out there who are feeling that deeply and they need some hope. So we were talking this through and one of our wonderful colleagues, Goran, who's up, well, you know Goran very well, don't you, Bethany? He, um, he said, why don't you call it this? I've been listening to what you're saying. And so it's called Creativity as a Force of Social Transformation, an Odyssey. And as soon as we got that title in our heads, it was easy to organize. And the first thing we decided upon was there would be no keynote speaker. The, the, the thing will, well, it's actually going to start up on the Friday night with just a sort of a get to know you. We'll have a, we, we're working with a broadcasting, uh, um, a broadcasting program located in a school. These amazing kids are going to be there through the entire thing, documenting it all. Uh, so yes, it'll be a sort of a meet and greet, um, and but with some very intentional conversations on the Friday. When they get there on the Saturday morning, um, they're going to walk into a human library in the foyer of this amazing old school, which has been transformed into a social centre for the most underprivileged organisations in Ottawa. Um, indigenous groups. There are uh, there's food banks. I think there's there's women's shelters. It is remarkable what they've done with this building. So it speaks to the very topic that we're talking about. So we've got ten or twelve organisations who are going to be in that human library, and we have um, one of them. Just to give you an insight, is is something called Orchidstra. What, is that the it's the Venezuelan um, thing, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, that's from the El Stima project in Venezuela, where yeah. um, a famous conductor at that time was concerned mm -hmm. about uh, poverty in, in, in villages and towns throughout Venezuela. And he had an idea of giving them all uh, European instruments and giving them uh, free yeah. music lessons. And they began playing oh. classical music in these villages all over Venezuela. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That idea has been exported all over the world. And Peter's talking about the uh, example of that it exists in Ottawa, yeah. which is enlightening itself and reason reason alone for all of you to come and join yeah. us at the event yeah. the the lady who who um whose brainchild this was tina she is she is a tour de force so she's actually going to be there right through the conference but in the background of this human library we'll have eight to ten of these musicians um playing to give us a wonderful ambiance and then the rest of the day so we're, we're going to give the everybody a passport they're going to go they're just going to free flow amongst the human library, um, have the juices sort of um, stimulated by what's going on. And then the rest of the day is going to be, so what? So what are we going to do now to, so that all of us within our own sphere of influence can do something more? I'm sure people are already, something more to make the extraordinary happen. Mm. So, the final thing I'll say about this is that I, I reached out to the local school district and said, would you like to partner? And they instantly said yes. Now there are five, five I think, partners who are involved with us, including universities, uh, school district, and a couple of others. So I think, I think this, in, this idea that, boy, we need this right now has, has, has really catalyzed people's thinking. So thank you so much. Now, I know there, there are activities in the Innovation and Creativity Week, 
which is Innovation Creativity Day has been mm-hmm. saying has been yeah. put on the map by the United Nations, and then this week is built around it. Uh, we, I know Bethany was going to speak to a couple, one in Australia, what they're doing. That I, I'm, you'll have to excuse me I, in terms of the dates, but does this Odyssey overlap that week? Okay, and then absolutely Bethany, April oh, the nineteenth right. and April twentieth. So the idea for the audience is to be thinking, well, we could do that too, or what could my school do, or what could my company do yes. to put out a shingle the day of, yeah. uh, on one of the days in Creativity Week. And really, if you were to contact any one of us, especially our guests, George Zucros and Susan McCalmet, who are, who are aggregators of yeah. creativity actions around the world and we'll talk about that get get your notice to bethany look up her card uh on this show or after this show uh you can you can be you can kick off something in your own city your own school Mm -hmm. your own company and bethany right there's a new website going up for this and you you could you want to speak a little bit to that before we get around the room some more Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So our founder, Marcy Siegel, who um, mo- many of you know, um, used to say that World Creativity Weekend Day um, could be like Mother's Day. Um, many people celebrate it. Most people celebrate it. and But you celebrate it in your own way. Some people buy their mom's flowers. Some people give her a card. Some people make her breakfast in bed, right? So, um, so that's kind of the entire goal here for for creativity. However you want to celebrate it, however you want to do something differently, um, by all means, uh, we would support and help. We are run by a student organization out of Miami University in Ohio currently, and we are also here and set up to help support. Um, We can do brainstorming sessions. We can offer past examples. Uh, There are many elements and resources that we have um, to to help anyone consider um, how they could celebrate World Creativity mm. and Innovation Week and or Day. And this costs nothing. They can go Correct. to what, www.wciw.org. Yes. W- okay, .org. And mm-hmm. then you'll give them support. You know, it would be very cool for teachers to call and get support to do something like the what was happening in the school Peter showed us and uh, just scout troops, Girl Scout troops, Boy Scout troops, mm-hmm. um, skateboard, mm-hmm. skateboard groups, you know, yes. and, and, and do we now it is a, really it's a question. We have we have some time left on the clock. Do we want you to inter- I wonder if we want you to introduce what's happening in India or did in India and Australia, or George and Susan, I, we, you, we haven't heard from you yet today, and I wondered if you know of anything that's happening, or maybe we'll come back and look at some of those examples, and you, Susan, you're the, um, help me with the alphabets here, you're the direct, you're the co-director, and George, you're the director of the National Creativity Network, right, NCN, and, and so maybe George, you would talk a little bit about the resources that you are aggregating and how people can get on that list mm. and and be fed by it. So please say a little bit about NCN and your dreams for it and how we can support it and how you can support us. So oh, thank you, Phyllis. I, you know, I, I think what we'll do is quickly do an origin story because every superhero has mm. an origin story. <laughs> and in this case, our superhero is uh, Susan McCalmont and her work with Sir Ken Robinson. So we can touch on that because I think it goes back to your original question, are schools and everything else killing creativity? And it's not the schools because there are good teachers and it, there are good administrators and there are good. there's a lot of good people out there who want to do the right thing and do a good thing. But it's the creation of that um, environment that we've been talking about it where people can fail, but failing isn't the only thing. They can also succeed by choosing the things they want to study and pursuing greatness in whatever those things are. But, you know, we start this conversation because NCN flows from the Sir Ken Robinson tree. So we we should start there, Susan. And then I'm happy to talk quickly about the NCN articles of interest and other things we're about. And I just want to share that in an unlikely place like Oklahoma, 
back in 2006, there were several, I was leading a philanthropic organization at the time, but just started convening people from different sectors, from education, commerce, and culture. And as we started talking about why was Oklahoma at the top of every bad list and at the bottom of every good list nationally, um, what could we do about that? And encountered Ken Robinson at the time before he became Sir Ken Robinson, mm -hmm. invited him to Oklahoma, um, started working with him actually as um, our advisor on creating something that we initially called the Oklahoma Creativity Project. Um, his idea was to um, create a climate of possibilities. Mm. Um, he often would say, we can't mandate creativity, but we can come together and, and um, you know, as we bump into one another um, and, and let our guard down and start sharing, we can create those environments, whether they be in schools, whether they be in courtrooms, if they're in our homes, that are not fear-based, but they're love-based. Because he, like John Mackey from the CEO of Whole Foods, said at one of our creativity conferences, you know, you really have a choice to create these climates and these environmental climates that are non-judgmental, that allow everyone to thrive. Or we know, we all know what it's like when we walk into a classroom and everyone's afraid to raise their hand or to ask a question, or you walk into an office situation and no one is able to share their ideas about how to make the company better. So it was Sir Ken's idea that we could start this in Oklahoma. And as we started in Oklahoma, our Lieutenant Governor at the time, knew the Lieutenant Governor in Wisconsin, we connected, we flew to Madison on a very snowy, icy day and met with a creativity initiative that George was starting up. There were people in New Jersey and North Carolina. And before long, um, as Sir Ken invited us to become part of it, this international districts, districts of creativity network based in Belgium, there are 12 districts around the world that are connected that are seeking creativity change, um, you know, in uh, societal change. Um, our very first Creativity World Forum in Oklahoma, we had a pre-conference meeting just inviting individuals from different states and from Canada. We, we Peter was our, our lone Canadian, I think, at the time, and maybe someone else in Alberta. But um, we started thinking about how we could form this North American Creativity Network just connecting like minds on how we could, in our own way, plant these seeds of mm. creativity, encourage others, and as Sir Ken said, um, have a thousand flowers bloom. So that is what we're still trying to do. You know, we started back in 2010 with this National Creativity Network. Many of us, have our lives have changed. We're in different places. But we've stayed connected and we've stayed connection. Those connections have gone even further internationally so that we are sharing best practices. We're trying to, um, you know, from the macro to the micro in our communities, in our homes, in our places of worship, trying to affect change and allow people to to come from that love based environment and instead of the fear based environment for their ideas to help change the world. And as Peter said, we so need it right now. Mm. Yeah. But George has continued. Um, one thing National Creativity Network is doing, and I'll, and I'll toss this back to George, is to share all of the um, articles, ideas, documents mm. through um, a, a weekly um, server. So George, would you like to share that? It's amazing work and it goes far and wide to help encourage. I would love to, and Phyllis, I think you made a slide out of the articles of interest. Right. So back in the day, we started what we call the NCN, or National Creativity Network Articles of Interest. It has quotes, it has um, videos, it has all kinds of news articles about imagination, creativity, and innovation in all its forms. Um, so it's not an arts-based uh, idea, but the arts are definitely part of it but it's science and engineering and technology and math and humanities and everything you can think of that inspires imagination, creativity, and innovation. 
Um, it's a free service that we put out every Friday. Um, we're still trying to figure out the, the mail delivery as we got hijacked. Um, but you can go to the National Creativity Network's website, and there are at least four weeks of them um, archived there. So we encourage you there, but I think it's also, as has been spoken about a couple times today, it's about connection. And so it is a, it's a leverage point because National Creativity Network, the network, Canadian Network of Imagination and Creativity, it's not us being the thing, but us rather connecting to all the good people yeah. across the nation, across North America, and ultimately across the world who want to do this work and connecting them, their energy together, their inspiration together. Um, and we're just happy to continue to be able to do it. So, um, well, and, and George, so what we saw a minute ago was a collection, a very small snapshot of a collection of the articles. And underneath on the left is the link to right. where people can go and find that. And then we have the next slide. This is just a screenshot of your website, which which right. people can go to. So it's, what is it, www.ncn? It's actually the full the full word. So oh. it's www.nationalcreativitynetwork.org. Yeah. That's right. And so people can see that there are downloadable articles of interest uh, in groups by date and and the, it, there's just a plethora of mm -hmm. information there. Yeah. As always, there are no quizzes. So <laughs> nobody, has, nobody has to read the whole thing. They may <laughs> just like the quotes of the day. They might be inspired by a video. No quizzes, yeah. but there are a lot of resources there in all kinds of different ways. So. Well, well, and if I can just backpack onto an item George said, um, it is all about connections, celebrations, and resources. Um, it is amazing that that the four organizations are here today, and I am privileged to be a part of this. But it it we should be sharing this, and um, the more that we pass and promote and and pass this on to everyone else, the better our world can indeed be. So, thank you. It, it, I love I love the missive that you guys send out. I it's like my favorite thing to receive on Fridays. <laughs> Um, and my son's always like, what are you doing on Saturday morning? I'm like, I'm reading my missive. So <laughs> um, mm -hmm. well, to, to that end, Southern Oregon University is in May is having a major creativity conference. And I think if you just go to SOU, mm -hmm. look up SOU creativity conference, we can leave it in the notes to the show uh, that that's a significant they make a significant annual commitment to a several day conference on creativity. And, and, and for all of our listeners, if they come up with stuff like that and they want to send it to us, we will put it in the NCN articles of interest. And so we now, will tomorrow I'll be looking at Oregon, Southern Oregon going, all right, how do we get this in here? Yeah. Right. But and we will display it on our website as well. Nice. Nice. So let me put an oar in the boat, or take my oar out of the boat and put it in the water for a minute for the American Creativity Association. I offer that we are the grandmother and grandfathers of organizations. We've been around four decades uh, since 1986-87 and still are moving forward in this world of creativity and innovation. It uh, was the brainchild of two interesting groups in America, that's ERGO, American Creativity Association, although we've been around the world and have, I was chapter development officer for about 10 years, uh, and, we, and I was supporting 60 chapters around the world in most countries, uh, not and then many cities of the United States. But the interesting uh, origin story there is that leaders in gifted education, uh, that's a term of art in the U.S. for classes that, that are focusing on the creativity of the child, not on creativity, but the creativity within the child. So they they mm -hmm. would they were identified as gifted. I could go on for quite a long time about the beef I have with calling these children gifted and talented yeah. and how isolating, unfair. Mm -hmm. And as a lawyer, I, I almost I, I could have gotten involved in starting the Austin chapter of the American Creativity Association, or I could have flown to Washington, D.C. and got the legislation renamed 
because as a lawyer, I can tell you when you use ter- as a term of art, which means it's a specialized term, it means something very unique, like landlord and tenant in a rental agreement. Mm-hmm. When you use those terms of art, you already know, you don't know who the landlord and tenants are. It does, it's, it's a generic term. And those terms, gifted and talented, are, are not terms of art. They're generic terms. So if you label one child as gifted and talented, you take these people, everybody, everybody knows what those terms are. And, they, and you identify only a few children in a school as gifted and talented. You create division, anger, shame, blame, yeah. envy. It has done more harm. So I'm on, I'm a little bit on my 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 hot seat here. And I started a school for the gifted and talented children, which is still going, a private school in Austin, Texas. And I really wrestled with this. So I say the words because it's the truth. I also don't shy away from history and what's the truth. I, you know, we, we, there's a lot of innocence that goes along with our evolving awareness and consciousness. Uh, And, and it's, it takes courage both to use those terms and then to also be aware, self-aware of what we're doing. So to continue on my journey on behalf of the ACA, these, these teachers across the United States in the classroom and at the university level, teaching teachers how to teach this pop special population, uh, which is, it isn't that not everyone doesn't have different gifts and talents, but these children need fewer reputation. You know, I would call them the XPL children. Then you wouldn't assume you knew who they were. And you would have to say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that they think divergently, that they need three repetitions rather than 20, that they can be highly emotional, that they uh, that with this population goes a high number of dysgraphia or ADD or ADHD. They're very sensitive. They don't, they can test well or poorly. And then you you assemble uh, like 25 characteristics. You say, oh, okay, that's the LXP kid. And we can help them in the classroom and support them. So those, the teachers who taught teachers how to work with this population, along with, guess what? The leaders of R&D departments, like at Disney, like at DuPont, like at Alcoa, they somehow were having coffee or wine together somewhere. These, these two leadership groups, and especially the leadership at DuPont, which came up with like the post-it notes and a lot of our cool things in the late in the 60s, 70s, and late 80s, they came together and said, let's create an organization to advance creativity in every domain, not just in the United States, but let's we called they called ourselves, we called ourselves the American Creativity Association. And it's still going, we held annual conferences. Uh, kept up a journal and mailed it out snail mail when that was required. Mm. And I can tell the audience that some it also uh, funneled into about nine special interest groups within the larger umbrella covering the arts mm-hmm. and communication, but also business and technology, education and training, spirituality, the nonprofit NGO group, government and health and science. So it's applied art, thinking mm-hmm. art, it's IQ, EQ, SQ, somatic Q, and that's the ACA. And I have a slide to share with you. We have one of our most recent things is this show. It's called The Creative Life. You can see here we have over two and a half years of library. You could watch any one of these shows, I think, and just have a, a very inspirational takeaway. Uh, and we delve into many topics where the centerpiece is how do we release access and and honor our creativity, innovation, and imagination. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, so I welcome you to this show and to the ones we have in the past and those going forward. Give me a call or an email uh, if you want to be on the show or recommend a guest to be on the show. I, we This is very inclusive. So with that said, we have together introduced our different organizations. We've made, we've given some ideas that they're about SOU and other organizations. 
And we are still left with the question my caller had uh, about this topic of are we killing the creative spirit in our children? And she she wanted to know what the children who are now 24, 25, how are they being served, that generation? But what about today's generation as well? And George, you've got a, you've got a comment. Yeah. I just wanted to, to look to Bethany because um, her colleague Jim brought forward the notion that the current students are approaching creativity in a, in a way that surprised all of us. Not thinking, oh, how can I be more creative? But ah, I don't need that. So Bethany, can you talk to that? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, it's interesting. Um, we recently just returned back from a trip to San Francisco and we were taking a, cap a senior capstone class out there to do creative uh, consultant work. And um, as we were turned home, we started to hear some rumblings from the students. And it was interesting to hear the things that they were saying. Um, they were basically saying, um, I, I don't have to look around when I'm walking down the street because my phone tells me everything I need to know about the location that I'm at. Um, and it, it, Jim and I got kind of debating about this is is google and um our repetitious nose when our children are toddlers are these things killing creativity i have both a five-year-old and a 16 year old so um i'm constantly in the ah, and no don't drive off a cliff phase of parenting but um it it was interesting to see the students and their reactions to to connection and just being open minded and and whatnot as they kind of progress through this course and I'd love to hear your thoughts um, mm. if compliance and and the readily available answers that we are giving our children of today um, if this is hindering creativity. Well, I, I'm I know I've been talking and I'll make this really short. But it, it, it seems to me it isn't about what we do, it's about what we remove. And my point is, if we remove, it, it's a very different conversation to talk about the stigma of making mistakes, of not have, being prepared to be wrong. So, I, I, you know, there is competition in the field uh, for being creative in ways that we did in the past, kept track of time and schedules and finding information and the, it's still in the room with us today this question of whether it's okay i mean especially with google and smartphones and and access instant access we'll be having a chip in our brain we'll be plugged in like borgs to the internet we'll have all information but will we be wise will we be creative and will we be prepared to make mistakes and be wrong can you does it even up the ante for being made a, a fool of? Uh, we, you know, how do we keep alive a strong sense of it's okay to fail, it's okay to be wrong, and I, I and they're it, parallel tracks. Mm, I I think it goes beyond that as well. Um, I've created a library over the last ten years, probably three hundred videos with students, teachers, parents, business people as I'm trying to grapple with my understanding of how do we get it so wrong? So I don't think schools could kill creative. Well, I do, but I think there are reasons for that. Society kills it because we are so committed to thinking in hierarchies which stifle creativity. I'll give you an example. I don't want to give too many because I'm writing a book about this and nobody will buy it if I tell you all. It's, um, <laughs> it's the pathology of um, um, the hierarchy of leadership. So that when you think of leadership in a school, say, or an organization, very often that's done in a structured way. And people are not made to feel comfortable to speak their mind and speak their truth. And so often that's the first impediment. The answer, flatten the hierarchy. Do not take yourself too seriously as a leader. Take the job seriously and get over your ego. You need to 
you, I think the number one priority of a leader is to create the space so that the brilliant potential informal leadership comes out with everybody around them. The second pathology is the way we define intelligence in a hierarchical way. And that is, that is, is so damning for so many kids. We mm. tell them that they're not smart when they are absolutely brilliant. We're shining the light in the wrong place. So that's the, that's the second hierarchy. And the third hierarchy is creativity. We are bound and determined to say, these kids are creative, these kids are not. Mm. Arts, arts kids, oh yeah, creative, very clever scientists. But we don't look at the mechanic and say, wow, you're, you're, you've got some creative genius, or the plumber who's working under the most horrendous conditions. Right. We, um, so I think those three together um, need to be front and center in our thinking and need to help us in the reimagining how we're going to go forward uh, for a, uh, to, to cultivate the seeds of brilliance that lies in every kid and every teacher and every adult. Mm. One of the uh, things related to all of this is um, how, how can we create atmospheres, conditions, structures to encourage creativity? How do we, and uh, particularly, uh, you know, cr uh, creativity is a process and not really individual. It's a collective enterprise. Um, there's some debate about that, but I'm on the collective side myself. Um, and one of the things that uh, Cynic tries to point out is that if we have a group of people, whether they're students or football players, I have to get football in here somewhere, um, that... Uh, <laughs> um, if you create for them a sense of groupness, a sense of that you 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 are individually significant and you're significant because you're part of the group, both of those things, and if you get them into the state where they can laugh at themselves and laugh at each other at the same time because of the same experience, uh, you're beginning to build that level of trust, that level of nakedness. Uh, that allows you individually and as a group to be, uh, to um, capture the creative potential which is there. Um, and I seem I, I I sort of look at this from the point of view of how we shut down those opportunities. It's not you know we're all inherently creative, but we don't all have the same opportunities to express it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me we it's a breaking down barriers to some extent. You know, our, all societies want to be compliant because. We want everybody to understand what the rules and regulations are about getting along with others in society. I get that. But um, there also needs to be the opportunities for us to individually and collectively feel as if we can trust ourselves and each other in order to make mistakes, to make idiots of ourselves, mm. as I've obviously had no trouble doing for years, um, and that we can promote that sense of collective and individual creativity and ultimately improve the significance and the kindness of humankind. Wow. That's, we can't leave on a more thoughtful note, Michael. And so thank you. We will leave it right there mm -hmm. uh, to our audience. You have been watching The Creative Life from Think Tech Hawaii. We have been discussing the question of whether our kids are afraid to be creative or just unwilling or neither of the above mm -hmm. with a panel of leaders in the in organizations that are now promoting creativity, innovation, and imagination. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleece, and the past president of the American Creativity Association and current president of the Austin chapter. Joining me today to answer the question and bring to our attention ways to keep creativity alive have been our guests, George Zucros, board chair of the National Creativity Network, Susan McCalmont, board vice chair of the National Creativity Network, Susan, I'm sorry, Peter Gamwell, who's co-founder of our Canadian Network for Imagination and Creativity, Bethany Schwann who is Deputy Steward for the World Creativity Innovation Week and Day Support Organization, and Michael Wilson, another co-founder of the Canadian Network for Imagination and Creativity. 
Mahalo panel for joining us and mahalo to our viewers for tuning in. We will be back in another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha.